constantly changing, never quite the same anywhere. Weather affects every one of us, every day of our lives, in everything we do. We're never sure what the weather will be in the weeks or months ahead. And there doesn't seem to be much we can do about it. Is there a pattern in something so vast and complicated as the weather? If there is, how can you find it? This is a problem scientists have been trying to solve for more than 50 years. Yet this man hopes to find a pattern that will give scientists a better understanding of the weather and help them make accurate forecasts of what the weather will be a week or a month from now. He is attempting to create weather by numbers as an experiment. Here's the weather report for Kansas City for the next 12 hours. Partly cloudy and continued mild tonight and tomorrow is the Weather Bureau's forecast for Kansas City and vicinity. The low tonight will be about 50 degrees and the high tomorrow will be near 80. Records show that forecasts like that are more than 85% accurate. To make that forecast, meteorologists had to study over a thousand pieces of information about the atmospheric conditions over Kansas City, where the report was issued. To forecast what the weather in Kansas City will be 36 hours from now, a meteorologist would have to work with 10,000 measurements from an area covering the United States, Canada, and the oceans. To forecast what the weather will be four days from now in Kansas City, a meteorologist would have to take into consideration 200,000 measurements from the whole northern hemisphere and up into the stratosphere. To forecast longer for, say, a couple of weeks ahead, you would probably need to know what's happening below the surface of the oceans as well as over the entire surface of the Earth and try to find a pattern to over half a million pieces of information about the atmosphere. Why does he need to know so much information to even begin to forecast a few weeks ahead? Why does he need to know what's happening in the air over Australia to get an idea of what will happen in Kansas City a few weeks later? Well, here's why. The atmosphere over the Earth is 20 miles deep and contains four billion cubic miles of air. The water in this tank represents that atmosphere. This dye will make its motion visible. The air over the Earth is constantly moving in patterns that are much more complex than any of those you see here. As various kinds of weather develop in this vast ocean of air, they move and interact in very complicated ways. And in the real atmosphere, everything is changing. Wind direction and velocity, temperature, humidity, and air pressure. To even begin to forecast weather, a meteorologist must deal with all these changes. Finding a pattern in this chaos seems impossible, and yet, Scientists are accepting this challenge. In Washington, D.C., Dr. Joseph Smagorinsky of the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory of the Environmental Science Services Administration is trying to develop a better understanding of the many forces that shape our weather. Here is how Dr. Smagorinsky defines the problem. Data about the weather, wind, temperature, humidity, and pressure from all over the world come to this room and are recorded on maps as symbols and numbers. But symbols and numbers represent a lot more than small bits of weather information. Several times a day, at thousands of places on the Earth, observers collect weather data. Twice every day, at noon and midnight Greenwich time, special balloons equipped with radio transmitters are released into the atmosphere. They send back information on temperature, pressure, wind, and humidity. More information comes from aircraft and ships at sea. And every day, satellites orbiting the Earth send back photographs of the changing atmosphere. So the symbols on the map represent the cooperation and hard work of people all over the world, as well as information about wind direction and velocity air temperature, 
humidity, and air pressure. From measurements like these, we know that the weather at any place, at any hour, is part of a huge meteorological system covering the whole globe. It can't be brought into the laboratory, so scientists who work with the weather, meteorologists, physicists, oceanographers, and mathematicians have to find other ways of experimenting with it. How do you begin to tackle a problem like this? We know the atmosphere is a mixture of gases, and there are physical laws that apply to all gases. Then why not try to apply these laws to the gases that make up the atmosphere? The gases in the atmosphere are inside this box. There's air inside, and it's sealed, so no air can get in or out. That instrument inside is a simple barometer that measures the pressure of the air inside the box. When I pour hot water over it, the air in the box will get warmer. Watch what happens to the needle of the barometer. As the temperature of the air goes up, the pressure also rises. The warmer the air gets, the greater the pressure. If you know how much the temperature changes, you can predict the changes in pressure. The scientists describe this relationship with a simple formula. The temperature, T, is expressed in the absolute scale, where zero is minus 273 degrees centigrade. The pressure, P, is expressed in inches of mercury. Let's say the temperature is 300, and the pressure is 30. Then the temperature divided by the pressure equals 10. If the temperature increases to 310, then the pressure increases proportionately. But the relationship remains constant. So scientists express the relationship as T over P equals a constant, K. If you know what the temperature is, and the value of K, you can find the pressure by solving the simple equation. Now this formula applies to gases under very special conditions. Let's change some of the conditions and see what happens. Let's assume the air in this box is heated on this side and cooled on this side. You can see that the temperature will vary throughout the box. How are you going to compute the pressure? You could divide the box in half. Now you could find what the temperature is on this side and compute the pressure, and the temperature on this side and compute the pressure here and average them. This would be a very rough approximation because the warm air here should rise, so it'll be warmer up here than it is down here. The cold air should stay at the bottom, so it'll be colder down here than it is up here. Well, you can get a closer approximation then. by dividing it into four smaller boxes. Now you could find the temperature in each one of these boxes and compute the pressure using the formula. You can get an even closer approximation by dividing it into 16 smaller boxes. Now you could measure the temperature in each one of these boxes and use the formula to compute the pressure. You'd have to do that 16 times. The more boxes you use, the more accurate your answer should be. But even that's not good enough. I'll add some smoke. See how the air circulates? The air is constantly moving, and its temperature and pressure are changing second by second. K 
calculating the conditions of the moving air in this box would be very complicated. Imagine trying to figure out what's happening in the atmosphere. Four billion cubic miles of air heated by the sun, containing moisture and constantly moving. But meteorologists working with mathematicians have been able to express the forces acting on the gases in the atmosphere with six formulas. These formulas express the basic laws of motion developed in the 17th century. Later, they were extended to fluids. But the use of these formulas in the study of the weather involves a very complicated technique. All of the formulas have to be used together because the variables like wind direction and velocity, pressure, temperature, and humidity describe changes in extremely small volumes of gas over small fractions of a second. So, we need to know how thousands of these tiny units will interact in order to predict what could happen in a single hour. In fact, in 1922, Richardson, a British scientist, worked out a way to do the calculations. He proposed getting data from 2,000 stations. To process this information by hand, 64,000 mathematicians would have to work continuously, day and night. There was no practical solution until the modern computer came along. Whenever I walk through our computer room, I am reminded of how much we owe to the brilliant mathematician John von Neumann. In 1947, he began to develop the granddaddy of all modern computers. It could do the calculations of 100,000 mathematicians. One of the first problems fed into the computer was the pioneer study of the atmosphere led by Jules Charney. Later, Norman Phillips did the first general circulation calculations. I had leave of absence to work with this group. In 1955, after I had returned to the Weather Bureau, we began to prepare our first experiment. The experiment would include most of the Northern Hemisphere, from the equator to 64 degrees north. Now remember, to calculate what happened to the air in this box when we heated and cooled it, we had to work out the formula for many different places. To calculate mathematically what would happen to the air over the Northern Hemisphere, Dr. Smagorinsky and his fellow scientists chose 1,300 grid points like these. They decided to work out the formula at every one of the places where these lines cross and at two levels of the atmosphere. They assumed the sun had not yet been turned on, so the ocean of air over the Earth was still. The temperature would be the same everywhere. Then in the experiment, they would turn on the sun. The Earth gets hotter at the equator than farther north, so the air over the Earth would be heated unevenly. The formulas they chose not only allowed for the heat of the sun, but also included the forces acting on the atmosphere due to the rotation of the Earth. As the computer calculated the changes taking place at those 1300 grid points, would the mathematical atmosphere begin to look anything like the real atmosphere? Many experienced people are needed to prepare a mathematical model of the atmosphere for testing in the computer. It may take many years to prepare a single model and then to test it. The basic equations have to be analyzed and broken down into the kind of simple arithmetic operations a computer can handle. The logical operations then have to be organized to determine what has to be prepared. The operations then have to be programmed as a set of instructions for the computer. Even the simplest experiment requires thousands of such instructions. Now these instructions are put on punch cards, which tell the computer what to do. Next, the computer does all the calculations necessary to show the changes occurring at our 1300 points. Even this simple experiment required several million operations to represent the changes that would occur in the atmosphere during a single day. If you could make a motion picture of what is happening mathematically at the 1300 grid points 
as the computer runs through its calculations, it might look something like this. The numerical values at each grid point for temperature and other variables change as the computer solves the basic formulas and computes their effect. Actually, the computer solves the formulas and calculates the movements of the atmosphere for a series of small time intervals. When it is calculated, all the changes in all the variables at all 1300 grid points for the first interval of time, these results are then used to forecast what will happen in the next step. The results of the second step are then used to forecast the third, and so on for the duration of the experiment. What Dr. Smagorinsky and his colleagues were attempting to do mathematically can be illustrated in a very rough way with the water in this dish, which again represents the air. But this time, over a rotating Earth. The center, where the ice is, is the Arctic region, cooling the air. Now we need heat at the equator. These drops of dye will show you what happens in a very simplified way. Now remember what happened to the air in the box when it was heated and cooled It soon became intermixed. What will happen to the air over half the Earth when it's heated and cooled and rotated at the same time? The mixing of the air forms spiral-like patterns which meteorologists call cyclones. Such cyclonic patterns are typical of what happens in the atmosphere. By observing the general circulation of the atmosphere, we find that the winds blow west to east in the middle latitudes and gently move in a wave-like pattern with five or six such waves about the pole. Some of the waves are very large and contain a closed cyclonic circulation of low pressure. Would our mathematical model evolve patterns anything like this? At a fixed time every day, the computer was instructed to print out data in the form of a map. We analyzed these maps to find out what was happening in our mathematical atmosphere. Day by day, we could see patterns slowly evolving. Finally, after about 50 days, we got something that actually looked like the real atmosphere. Our simple model was able to account for the broad wind currents in the northern hemisphere, and even showed, in a very primitive way, the waves in these currents responsible for the huge cyclonic storms which form in middle latitudes. These results were very encouraging. But we had ignored many things in our first experiment. Could we now construct a more sophisticated mathematical model and come up with a more detailed picture of what is happening? Starting out with actual measurements of the real atmosphere at a given time, could our formulas simulate the actual changes that occurred in the real weather over a period of four days? This is the area they decided to work with, the whole northern hemisphere. Instead of 1,300 points as before, they decided to expand them to 5,000. They would apply the laws at each of the places where these lines cross, 5,000 grid points. In addition to variations in wind direction and velocity and temperature, the new model will also allow for variations in humidity and how changes in humidity would affect the other variables. Also, the effects of the Rocky Mountains and the Himalayas would be taken into account. Because the atmosphere is 20 miles high, they also needed to take into consideration the conditions at many levels above the surface. Now there would be nine levels. In the earlier experiment, there were 6,500 variables. Now there would be 180,000 variables to describe the state of the model atmosphere at any one time. 
Now, to begin their forecast experiment, Dr. Smagorinsky and his colleagues had to start with the actual conditions of the weather in the Northern Hemisphere. Collecting and analyzing data from all over the Earth for such an experiment is a big job in itself. Information like this is collected every day by the National Meteorological Center of the U.S. Weather Bureau and is supplied to us for use with our mathematical models. For over 10 years, they have been using simpler models for making predictions. We hope the more advanced models we're working with will eventually help them improve the accuracy and the range of their predictions. We had picked the weather at noon, Greenwich Mean Time, on Tuesday, January 14, 1964, as a starting point. So we had to collect information from all over the Northern Hemisphere, up to 100,000 feet, at the precise time on that date. The 180,000 pieces of data for that date, as well as the basic formulas, have to be fed into the computer. About 30,000 computer instructions are needed to predict what changes would occur at 45,000 grit points every five minutes. These numbers would represent the changes at each of these points. Using these results, the computer would then make calculations about what changes would occur every five minutes over a period of four days. The computer programmed according to our formulas would have to perform 20 billion operations to simulate a single day's weather. In all, 80 billion for four days. We wondered how close the mathematical model would be to the real weather after processing all this information. We weren't sure it would hold up for even two days. When the computer printed out the number map for the first day, we all were on hand to see what it looked like. From the printed numbers, Dr. Smagorinsky and his staff could get a picture of how the formulas were functioning. Using this information and other output from the computer, they could plot the mathematically predicted weather on a map, the same way a meteorologist plots the real weather. How close would their mathematical weather be to the real weather? Here's the map prepared by the U.S. Weather Bureau that shows the amount of rain or snow that fell on the United States on the first day of the experiment. You can see that there was very little precipitation. The shaded lines in the state of Washington and in Canada indicate an accumulation of more than one-tenth of an inch in the 24-hour period. Only small amounts fell in California and in Texas. Here, for comparison, is a section of the map made by the model from the data the computer had processed according to the formulas. It is the first day's forecast. The model correctly predicted that no large amounts of precipitation would fall in the United States. There was an error in the prediction for the small area of Washington. This can be blamed both on inadequate observations in the Pacific and an inadequacy of the model. At the end of the second day, our mathematical model showed considerable precipitation in the Pacific Northwest and in the Gulf states. But how would it compare to the actual weather for the same day? The model successfully predicted the area where there would be substantial precipitation for the second 24-hour period. However, the predicted amounts of precipitation were not quite as great as the amounts actually observed. We think that this error is a result of not having properly stated some of the physics. But we were pleasantly surprised that the calculations didn't blow up. The third day, the real precipitation developed like this. Both the large areas have spread eastward. The mathematically produced weather surprised us. The predicted precipitation pattern is essentially the same as the actual pattern, although the amounts predicted are not quite enough. We were encouraged to see that the model held up reasonably well for the third day, but could it do as well for the fourth? On the fourth day, the Weather Bureau observed these actual changes in the weather. The precipitation held along the west coast, but in Texas it stopped, and the center moved to the southeast Atlantic coast. 
Also, some began over Lake Superior. Would the same changes hold up in the mathematical model? Although the Southeast United States was predicted correctly, some important differences from the real weather are beginning to show up in the model. The smaller errors noted earlier are beginning to have a serious effect. Yet the mathematical model came through surprisingly well. Also, the model predicted the wind and the temperature and the humidity over the entire northern hemisphere, all the way up to 100,000 feet and for the entire four-day period. It looks as though we may eventually be able to make useful predictions about what will happen in the atmosphere for a week or possibly even longer, completely by mathematical models. Every time we run an experiment, we get a better idea of the physics of the weather. The more we experiment, the more precise our models become. We could use more and better observations, and certainly faster computers. But what we have done so far shows we're on the right track. Some of us are looking ahead to using improved models to work out actual long-range forecasts for the entire world. Others are exploring models to answer such questions as how will the climate change if the amount of carbon dioxide in the air continues to increase? Or what would happen if we could produce artificial clouds? Or again, what if the ice at the poles were colored black to speed up melting? Dr. Smagorinsky and other scientists have accepted the challenge to find a pattern in the seemingly chaotic forces that make the weather. As our resources for collecting weather data expand, as faster computers are built, and as scientists improve their mathematical models, we get closer to understanding what causes the weather we'll have next week or next month. Someday, we may have accurate long-range forecasts, and who knows, we may even find ways to do something about the weather through 